Good morning. Good morning. Brady, good to be here with you, Will. Will Googe, our newest guest on the live show. Um, for all those who will be hearing this as audio on the podcast, um, just to give you a bit of reference as you may hear some pointers to a live show. This is recorded live on Facebook. Um, welcome to everyone who's tuning in live. Uh, very excited to have you on this uh, for a chat here, Will. Um, a guy who um, I have a huge amount of respect for, uh, a, a very fascinating guy with a plenty of um, interesting yarns and, and journeys to his name. Um, so thank you so much for being here. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. What time did you get to bed last night? Uh, about half one, two. And why? Why was that? Why so late? Uh, well, my plan didn't go as straightforward as I thought. Um, I was on day two of my 12 marathons of Christmas, so one a day, every day for 12 days, started on Monday, um, and my last one will be on Christmas Day. I was on a photo shoot up, up north in Manchester. Everything was going great, and then, unfortunately, some things happened that made the, uh, the shoot go over by two and a half hours, and I wasn't fast enough to do a marathon in about two hours 35 so I had to I had to take the train home and then get after it when I got home so I started it uh, just before half nine so wow. wrapped it up at one o'clock or something wow so um there's a bit of an insight into when you're a dude who's taken on an unbelievable challenge 12 marathons at Christmas um but you're you're still getting on with everyday life, and uh, you got you got bits and pieces to get done. You got a shoot in Manchester, uh, you got a train to catch, but you got you got a marathon a day to do for twelve days. It's pretty insane. Um, themselves do they, G? Exactly. Um, but no, I mean, Will, I I would love, I want to get into some of the cool challenges challenges that you've done. Um, I guess. For everyone here who doesn't know who Will Googe is, um, Will Googe is a guy who has come on board as a, as a pure sport ambassador. He's been on board with us for a good two years now. He was one of our very first pure sport ambassadors. Um, and the way that took place was Will was undertaking a, a mammoth challenge, uh, a ultra marathon um, from John O'Grotz to Land's End. Um, and Will has gone on to take on board some unbelievable running challenges. Um, but as I alluded to earlier, there's there's many sort of facets to who Will Googe is. But um, Will, to kick off, I, I would love to kind of get an insight into where the where the story began for Will Googe. Like as a young young Will Googe, you know who you were, what life was like growing up and a bit of an insight into the story. Young Will Googe, well, my dad used to call me Chub Chub, so there's there's one intro to, <laughs> to who I was. But um, no, born and raised in Amptel, a town that I, I still live in now, today. Uh, it's a small town in Bedfordshire. I don't know what the population is, maybe like 5,000 or something, so a pretty small one. Um, growing up, I lived, I don't know, what you'd call sort of the idyllic, normal life, if you had to, if you had to choose how to grow up or what it's what it should look like, the natural order of things, I guess that's what I was living. Um, went to the local school, nothing ever really went wrong, had food on the table, had a family holiday every year. Uh, yeah, every, everything was hunky-dory. I had, I had no issues, no dramas. I was just, you know, living the dream, playing football, playing rugby, any kind of sport I could do, I was doing. And yeah, it was it was as normal or what you'd consider what you'd think is the ideal normal childhood life is exactly what I had. Really good. And you went on to play a bit of rugby too, um, a, a good level of rugby for Amptel. Um, yeah, lovely boy. Who's a bit of a local rivalry for my last club, Bedford. Amptel gave us a good. Um, few hidings last season so it wasn't much fun but you you were along at a few games and you so you actually had a few seasons under your belt with um Amdul 
And how, how was that for you? And, and obviously getting to that level, uh, you know, Amtel in the championship now, I think when you were playing there in the national one on their way up, yeah. uh, really on the rise, how, how, what was your sort of experience with rugby as a kid? Did what were your ambitions? Well, growing up, I was, I was actually never any good. Um, I still would argue that even, even when I was at my best, I was, I was effective because I just did all the shit that no one else wanted to do. I stuck to my strength. I wasn't flashy. I wasn't giving it some of the grace and around the back off flows like that. That just wasn't me. What I lacked for in my skill set, I made up for in uh, just, des just desire, really, and um, just doing the simple things right. So growing up, I remember my dad came to me one day because my brother was good. Like My brother was doing all the, all the stuff like playing county, doing the East Midlands thing. Uh, he did like Beds Academy before he went off to university. So he was always doing like the good stuff. And I was that kid that was in the team because I had mates in the team. <laughs> so I'd be on the bench or they might let me play, but really I was just there for the crap. And it was like, you sure you don't want to just like do fishing? Because <laughs> we'd go fishing. And I was like, no, nah, Dad, I actually, really, I actually really like it. Even though I suck, I like it. <laughs> and then what what kind of changed for me was controlling the controllable. Like, sure, I could have worked on my skills every day, but I thought there was a, a ceiling to what I could do with that. So as soon as I was 15, 16, I got in the gym, and I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but it was, I know I can get better from the right s size and shape for rugby in the position I play. I was playing 12, so I was like, I'm just gonna be the big ball carrying, hard hitting 12, don't throw offloads, pass it maybe twice in the game on average. And that's what I did. So I so kind of went, I, I, no, every, every English rugby team needs a good after back midfielder. Exactly. So I had to fit a mold I could fit. Um, and the way Amtel went was kind of how I went as well. So when I was 17, 18, I was, Playing from then, I was in the men's team and, well, playing seconds. And then as they kind of went up from the Marmite Snickers South Bedfordshire League up to Nat 1, I kind of rode that way for them. So for me, I never thought I'd get paid to play rugby. And in the end, I was. It, it was not a lot at all. But, yeah, if you'd have told me when I was 12 and on the bench for the B team, I'd have been like, ah, don't believe it, but cheers. Yeah. It's pretty amazing, man. Like. I, I remember playing rugby in Auckland, and, and Auckland uh, is it's like a hotbed of rugby talent. Like, mm. so many guys grow up living and breathing rugby. There's so many rugby players. The Pacific Island boys are like unbelievable athletes. They, they're so, solid and strong at a young age, skillful. Um, and, and, and there's so many great rugby players. Um, and what what's amazing is some of the guys that I played with that were, you know, 14, 15, that were the absolute superstars. Like you could have said this guy carves up so much, he's definitely going to be an all black. Mm. Some of these guys, um, they didn't go on to fulfill their potential. Um, but then on the flip side, there were some guys who had similar stories to what you just um, outlined with your own journey that, they weren't the ones that were outstanding, but almost through that, they had a different level of like commitment to to really like get stuck in, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those guys are actually the ones that I've seen go on to to have like the best careers. Um, in fact, a guy, uh, Aaron Smith, he's the All Black number nine now, one of the best, arguably the best scrum half in the world. Yeah. I remember being his roommate for New Zealand under 20 trials and he had him and I he had, we had both never made a national rep team we'd maybe scraped into a couple regional rep teams um and he's a guy who is an example to me of in high school he wasn't the superstar he was a pretty standard player um and man he worked so hard and he had that kind of extra drive to kind of like he knew that he couldn't rely on the talent um so it, it's 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 kind of cool like how 
that aspect um it plays such a massive part in our path you know um mm -hmm. w would you say that that kind of commitment and mentality realizing that actually i can't rely on uh just on skills or talent you know i can always work on developing these things but there's there's something within my control that i can get stuck into here um would you would you say that that mentality has played a part in these challenges these running challenges that you have undertaken definitely i, I mean i didn't realize it at the time but i guess that's always been who i've been and i'm only starting to realize it now but um yeah, definitely, because it's like, sure, I, I'll do these ultra marathons and I'll, real, I'll run real far, sure, give me a round of applause, great. But if you put me in an arena with elite ultra athletes in actual events, I, I'm not getting close to them. What I'm going to be good at is basically I'll, basically I'll never stop and I'll, I'll, give it, I'll give it my absolute all. So yeah. I'm still kind of, when I turn up to the start line at actual events, everyone's like, why is that? why is this hench guy here i mean i'm not as hench as i was but i'm certainly not i'm certainly not running shape but yeah yeah i just i'll i'll, I'll keep going yeah because how what are you are you about six foot two six foot three and about 91 kgs yeah about that um i normally float around right. that was a good, I, mean, I could ask you your weight yesterday but um so that was that wasn't a guess but <laughs> a good guess on the height but for for do like we're going to get into this further, by the way, so I'll, I'll just touch on it now. But you ran 870-odd uh, miles. Yeah. Um, man, like, guys that are running these long distances, they're usually very, very lean, um, small frames, not a lot of weight through the joints. So it's that's a kind of insight into, you know, how much kind of strain is going through the body and the joints um, when you're undertaking these challenges in comparison to perhaps some of these runners who are more kind of built and equipped for this um, this stuff. Yeah, sorry, I don't know what happened. I just lost you. Uh, all good. Um, no worries. I think we just lost a bit of the connection there, but that's fine. Um, no, but Will, so... Obviously, when we first came together, um, you know, the thing I loved the most about you was you were taking on these challenges, uh, this particular challenge, the John O'Grotts to Land's End, 870-odd um, miles, for a far bigger cause than yourself. It wasn't about you saying, oh, I've done this or... Um, it was for a bigger picture um, and it was something that was meaningful to me through my own journey and experiences um, and something that I really resonated with. But as well, what you touched on is I feel it what the challenges you undertake fit in so well with pure sport because, like you said, you don't see yourself as the most elite or competitive or advanced runner. Um, you're a guy who's showing quote unquote everyday people that mm. you can undertake unbelievable things and test your limits and you don't have to be seen as or look at yourself as a pro athlete or an elite athlete to be able to do amazing stuff. Um but I I wanted to kind of understand or I want I understand but I want the people listening to get an insight into what inspired you to undertake this um, John O'Gots to Land's End because to me it's an unbelievably inspiring and touching story. So if if you're happy, I'd love for you to kind of share that journey and how you undertook that. For sure. Um, so as I sort of alluded to earlier, like you asked me about my childhood, everything was sweet, isn't that? <laughs> like I, could, I, could, I had no complaints, everything, everything was great. When I heard that other people were upset, I'd be like, I'd be like, I don't get it. Like, you can control that. Like, life isn't that bad. So I was very ignorant in that sense. It's not something. I, it's not something I'm proud of. But um, nothing ever went wrong in my life, and 
um, at, this was in 2017. My mum got diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which she, she ended up having. She had cancer three times. Um, um, at this point, it was, the, it was the summertime and I was in LA because my ex lives there. Um, and at the time I was still playing rugby. So the idea of running for me was a total, total waste of time. I'm not gonna be, I'm not gonna lie. Like I would try and go for a run in the off season and I'd get to the top of the road. I'd be like, well, um, I wasn't, I wasn't high-fiving my teammates were doing something good. I wasn't scoring. We weren't winning. It was just, it was just a finish. So I didn't get it. But anyway, back to being in LA, when I'm having cancer. For some reason I woke up one morning, the sun hadn't risen yet. I was staying in Santa Monica and I decided to get up and go for a run for no particular reason at all. I got down to the concierge desk because I was at a hotel and I was wearing trainers and I just gave them in. I don't know why I did that. I was thinking beach run, it would be nice to get my toes in the sand. Anyway, I started running and I didn't run on the beach, well, I ran on the beach, but on the board, boardwalk. So it's slatted um, two by four timber, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I thought I'd go out for 10, 15 minutes, but what I ended up doing was I just, I kept running and I was like, okay, I'll run until I see the sun rise over this mountain or hill or whatever is in the distance and towards Malibu. And what I ended up doing was running all the way to the end of that beach and then running all the way back. And I didn't know how far I went at the time, but I think it worked out of being 14 kilometers. Wouldn't have been fast. Um, but when I got back, I had blood blisters and shit all over my feet, but I didn't, I didn't care. I was in, I was in that sort of elated mood that you get from a long run or running in general that I still get to this day. And a lot of people will talk about it as runners high or when they get back from a run, they feel really happy. And it's just, it's just endorphin flow. So there is some science behind it. But when I did get back to the hotel, I had a call from my mum because she had spoken to her doctor. And she got told she was in remission, so the cancer, the cancer was gone. She didn't have to have treatment anymore. So, the the combination of first long run, absolutely stoked from that. Didn't understand it, but hey, I was having a great time, and the best news I've ever had. Um, kind of solidified something in me at that point that I revisited later. So, unfortunately, it was about nine months after that she actually passed away, um, and. There was a moment there, obviously, I'm, de I'm absolutely devastated at this point. And as I said, nothing had ever gone wrong before. I'd had grandparents pass away, but that was the natural order of things. Um, never had anyone sort of close to me pass away before their time, other than maybe a neighbour, but was. But obviously that's not, that's not my mum. So totally devastated, not sure what to do, kind of lost. I have an opportunity here to wave a white flag and just use that every opportunity like oh i'm gonna go and get fucked up i'm i'm gonna give up on this i'm gonna do whatever but what i did instead out of respect for her was I, I tried to use that negative energy i had and it literally became my therapy from from that point out like i'd have i'd have conversations with people sure like i wasn't a total closed book but no one was reading the whole thing so i dealt with i dealt with my demons and emotions out on the pavement and sometimes i'd run and i'd be crying when i was running sometimes i'd be happy but um whatever sort of mood i was in i i would get back and feel a little bit better so i could i could get that piece of sort of the happiest i've ever been from that la run back every time i ran so it didn't fix things but that's what i did um and so following that um the first christmas after she passed away mums are all about christmas well my mum was at least cooks the turkey does the dinner wraps the presents puts the tree up decorates the tree invites everyone around she does everything so i'm not looking forward to it obviously so that i had been running i don't think i'd ever run that far at that point i might have done like a 16k or something but i decided to half take my mind off things and half um do do something good and elevate her as a reason for doing something good so i i ran a mar my first marathon on that christmas day following um 
raise money for Macmillan Cancer Support, who I'm raising money for now, and the Primrose Unit at Bedford Hospital that did most of our care. Um, and I think we raised about 14,000 in the end, which was totally insane to me. And I was getting a lot of good feedback from it. And as soon as I finished that, I was like, what, what else can I do? What, what is more than what I've done? And I've, I'd heard of ultra marathons. So I was like, sure, I can do some of those. Um, I t first of all, I thought, why don't I run from the top of England to the bottom? It's like exactly down the middle. <laughs> And then someone was like, why don't you just do John O'Groats to Land's End? I was like, well, wait, don't people cycle that? Thinking that, I, that it was a, just a cycle route. And they were like, yeah, but you, like, anyone can do it. So that's where that idea came from. And yeah, I ended up running it. Wow, man. It's pretty amazing um, to run your first ever marathon um, and to raised 14,000 pounds for Macmillan Cancer. Um, I mean, it's it's a pretty unbelievable thing and, a, and such an um, amazing sort of, uh, it's such an amazing thing to do in memory of your mum, you know. Um, I think it's, it's obviously I know of, I lost my father. Um, who was, you know, the closest guy to me, and from getting to know you, will seems that your your relationship with your mum was was very very close, and um, it's it's meaningful to carry them with us, isn't it? Mm, uh, for sure. And you know, the way I love to do that is uh, I, I, when when my dad first passed away, I, I found it very very difficult to talk about it, um, or even talk about him who was my favorite person um and 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 almost i think it was a bit because i feel perhaps as men we we maybe are taught or, or learn not taught but we kind of pick up we shouldn't we don't show our emotion that much or or if something's really difficult or heartbreaking we we don't express it or show yeah, it. Well, wow. yeah we man up and I think my biggest challenge was uh, I always, people would be like, oh, you're, and it's kind of tough because it's awkward for people. They don't really know how to address it either. And especially yeah. if you're closed off, it kind of is a bit awkward. But when people would be like, oh, you're good, like they knew it was the most devastating thing. And I'm sure the same for you. And people are, like, are you okay? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah I'm all good. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the, to me, it sounds like you found something within you that is a place of connection with your mum, you know, when you're out running. Sure. Um, was, am I right in saying, like, you, you, there's a sense of, like, there's that connection still there and it's, it's keeping that kind of bond? Yeah, definitely. And like, like with you, after she passed, people thought I was dealing with it too well. Like at the funeral, I was on, I was in good form. Um, I delivered a speech there and rang it off all the way to the end, and then only just started crying at that point. But so, that's also something I've found since then is when I'm doing a challenge or whatever, thinking about it or thinking about finishing, I get very emotional about it or thinking about her while I'm running. But then when it comes to the end or the delivery, like of the speech, that's when I feel what my strongest and when I feel she's kind of there backing me up and i'm i'm proud to to deliver it in sort of a, ver a very strong and direct way rather than maybe breaking down where like you'd think i would yeah. Um, but yeah in in terms of running and and feeling connected to her she she loved gardening she was always outside there's i spoke about it last time my story but this particular run i did yesterday was the route that I did basically every night when I was very emotional after she passed. And there's there's a lavender bush on the way. We had lavender bushes outside a house when we were growing up. So that reminds me of her. There's there's always things that happen or picture reminds me of her. And then I might see like a robin. And then when I'm running along, I'll see another one or the same one and just assume it's her looking down on me. So I get I get those little connections where 
things might seem a bit strange or uh, you know sh shouldn't have happened and they do and then I, I I assume it's like a little sign from her so I get immense like satisfaction in yeah. like feeling her presence when I'm doing these things it, it, it's it's kind of interesting isn't it because for some people these speaking of like like these signs or these connections might sound a bit like eerie fairy mm -hmm. and, and if I hadn't experienced the passing of my dad and then these type of things happening to me, um, I would be like, oh, it sounds a bit of a concept. But mm. what these things happening and these little reminders or these like, I mean, the kind of just things that you 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 would never be able to kind of make up um, that happen and it's just like, wow, that, that has to be like, you know, some sort of connection. Mm -hmm. um, they almost give you an insight into the fact that there is something kind of like, you know, without getting too kind of philosophical or spiritual, like there is some sort of bigger connection going on here. And I feel one of the, although it was the most challenging time of my life and still one of the biggest, you know, like hardships for me is not having my dad, I, I I can't help but feel thankful for what I've learned from his mm. passing because it's allowed me to see there's something bigger at play that I didn't, I don't think I had any idea of before that. Yeah. And it kind of it seems like what you're seeing with these moments of connection and reminders and uh, little amazing kind of little insights, would you say it's a similar type thing? Yeah, definitely, and I'd I'd say I'm a better person because it because of it. Um, I'm not saying I would ch I I would swap everything right now to have a back for sure. End of story. Um, but I'm I'm a better rounded person because of because of that, and I use I use her as my reasoning for doing a lot of things in my life, um, and all the things I use for her reasoning it are, are all positive things. So. Yeah, it's like it's it's homage to her and the the effect she had on me as sort of a as a kid and growing into a young man that I hold her in such high esteem that I can't I can't just waste this time I've got now because I'd feel like it wasn't doing her justice. Mm. Yeah. No, it's um I think an amazing testament to the wonderful special lady that she was but also a legacy that's like carried on within you you know of her which is um yeah I, i'm always in my experience i'm thankful i'm like forever grateful that i had my dad for 21 years yeah um, lucky because now yeah and i'm like for for a few years i was i hated the world man you yeah. know and i didn't i didn't find something like running to put my focus into i threw my rugby away i i was the one who was like fuck this i'm just gonna get wasted i i i, I hate the world um but when i s had an insight into what you're talking about that that sense of connection with my dad that I, even though he was passed my life became more of like uh i'm gonna honor you know that what he did for me and mm -hmm. and you know his kind of memory um so it's just it's cool it's like you you take the it's a, it's a it's a sign of life that you can take the most difficult horrible experience and turn it into something of strength and insight and hope um and i think that's the most inspiring thing from me as your friend but also you know seeing your journey that you're doing that with a bigger picture you know, um, with your runs and how you're able to carry that story through your running, through your challenges to give hope and inspiration to other people, but also to raise money for these unbelievable charities that are going to help people too, which is um, Mandy will be bloody smiling down, mate, that's for sure. And, uh, yeah me for sure she wouldn't she probably wouldn't like what i was doing and she'd be <laughs> my grand so her her mum i call her ma uh she's still around and they're very similar in that fact whereas they're they're the nicest they're the nicest people on earth but they're always 
they were always like, oh, you don't, you don't have to do that or don't do too much because they're protective. But um, at the end of the day, they, they respect or would respect um, what I'm doing and would be the first at the first at the finish line, give me a hug as I finished it. Probably the incredible after. <laughs> yeah. But like, what the heck are you bloody doing, Will? But I'm proud, yeah, of, proud so. of you. Proud of you. <laughs> um, mate, so tell us a bit about some of the mental challenges, not just mental, but physical as well, of this John O'Gots to Land's End. Break me down like the actual kilometers, the time in which you did it. Um, and get like a bit of insight into the training you did, how much mm. training I was going into it. Um, and yeah, man, I'd just love to hear how it was the experience of it. Well, I'll start I'll start with the training and say I didn't I didn't do enough and I definitely wasn't ready. Marathon was eight months before I started it, or eight and a half. So if you're going from running 26.2 miles to attempting to do 875 there is no training plan i don't think on earth that is going to make it easy i don't think there's any training plan whatever level of runner you are to make to make that sort of a walk in many parks um and with a lot of things in my life like all through school i kind of just winged, i kind of winged it i was the guy that didn't didn't really um revise or anything um would get to I'd get to exam day and I'd I'd do I'd do okay or I'd do enough. So that was kind of similar with the training plan. Of course, I was running more than I I would have done. I did I did another two marathons in that time and two ultra marathons. So my first one was London to Brighton, which is a really really cool one. So you hear a lot of people biking it. Um, the run is a different route because most of it's trail, which I didn't know because wing it. I didn't read the. Uh, I didn't. I didn't read the pre-race thing. I was just like, oh, I'm going to turn up and have, have a bloody good time out in the sun. <laughs> but I don't remember what time of year it was. It was freezing. Um, so that was a 63 miler, and I think that took me about 16 hours to do. Um, if I was to do it now, it'd obviously be a lot less. But learned a lot that day about um, pushing past boundaries that I perceived as when I was finished. So. I got I got an inkling into into that world um, and still still enjoyed it and I I was listening to a lot of podcasts at the time and a book by David Goggins who's a total savage but I love the guy um, so I was kind of, I was kind of just trying to be like Goggins towards the end I don't know if you, if the people watching or listening at any point they'll they'll probably know who the guy is but. Yeah, he's a freak. I'll, I'll definitely Google him after this anyway, at least. Yeah, you should. You should. And he's got a real good book and get it in the audiobook version because he talks it through. And they go through all the chapters um, as sort of a podcast thing with him and the narrator. Um, but he talks about something called Taking Souls where when he was in the Marines, um, SEAL training, um, he was going through Hell Week. And obviously it's an, it's an awful experience. And... Uh, sort of the uh, their superiors put put them through hell. That's why it's called Hell Week. And he uh, he made something up called Taking Souls, where however bad it got, that him and his his team would always have a smile on their face, and <coughs> excuse me, they would take the souls of their superiors by by basically never giving up and and sometimes singing when they were doing these awful things. So. When I got to the last ten miles of that, it was it was taking souls time for me. I mean, it's not no near on the same level. Don't don't get it. I'd gone through the day as my usual kind of buoyant self, laughing and joking at all the eight stations, and then it got to the last ten mile or the last ten k, and I was like, "Nah, it's time to." Like there was a guy that I was leap from. We were going back and forth. And it got to a point I was like, nah, I'm good. I'm smoking this guy. <laughs> he's never he's never gonna see me again. I'm gonna take his soul. And then from that point on, I decided that every person I see, however far away they were, I was gonna get past them. So the last 10k was was savage mode. And that was a big learning curve for me because I would need that in abundance when I was doing Johnny Goats to Land's End. Um yeah, I did one other ultra that was it's called the wall. So it's the, the length of Hadrian's Wall that goes from uh, Carlisle to Newcastle um, and like I said two other marathons and then then I was beginning but 
I'd never done a marathon and ran the next day. I'd never did that. I was in bits. And obviously when I did the ultras, I didn't run for maybe a week. So all of a sudden I'm in a scenario where day one, I ran 63 miles and it was go to sleep, get up and <laughs> you kind of got to do the same thing or get close to it because the only way I was getting out of it was finishing. So yeah, the first day, the first day went well because I'd run that distance before and obviously I was buzzing. I was, I was in a place I'd never been before. I was doing something huge and I was doing it for my mum and I told everyone I was doing it and I had had friends come in like I, he's he's my brother now Josh Josh Warner who him and my brother had a business together they were always friends um he gave up work for, for basically a month to come and help me two weeks before I started because um he was calling me because he's in the events world and he listed off these questions have you done this and it's like nah you done this I was like oh yeah yeah. <laughs> and then there's a cut to like the third question. We were at breakfast in Wogan, not too far from here. And he just like shook his head and next to me and goes, uh, I'm gonna help you with this. <laughs> the whole thing, like that concept of winging it, it, cont it continued the whole time. Um, so he was on board and a great well, friend of mine. In terms, in terms of like, where are you gonna sleep? What's your stock point? What, yeah, basically. What kind of terms of your fuel your food yeah your friends. like had you had you just sort of kind of thought these things through roughly and this dude was like bro <laughs> if you're gonna run 870 odd miles from john and to lands in yeah you need to have specific things yeah. about you. you're a bit like oh fuck Maybe yeah I, <laughs> I didn't have, i didn't have any vehicles at this point i didn't have support vehicles so yeah i didn't have i didn't have If worse comes to worse, this it was it was an Amex. I was like, I'm pretty sure this thing doesn't have a limit, so I'll do all that some other time. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I didn't have anything in place. And another guy, Robbie Ballinger, I call him Belanger because it sounds way cooler. Um, he's a guy I'd met in the lead up and kind of an a um, what's it called? A showing of how social media can actually be amazing rather than just this bullshit world, bullshit world where people are selling anything and everything. Um, again, I was in LA, went to a cryotherapy place because they let me go and use it. I love, I'm hot on my recovery and using the best stuff, taking the best supplements, all that kind of stuff. I'm really interested in recovery in general because of what I do. It's, it's, a, it's something I have to know or at least have an inkling into what's good. So cryotherapy I was there the guy was like oh you should follow this guy Roy Belenga he's he's running from uh, LA to New York so he's running across the whole thing it's like 3,200 miles or whatever I was like yeah I really should follow that guy because this was before I started my challenge this was in March um so I follow him from like day seven to day 75 when he finishes so he's averaging 42 miles a day and this at this point, I've watched basically every day and read every post, and I'm like, this guy is insane. Far out. Yeah. Actively, actively thinking, I'm like, I'm not going to message him like when he's finished because there'll be press, everyone will be interested in what he's done. I'm going to wait a week. So there I go, wait a week. <laughs> What's the time? Not been a week yet. <laughs> a week passes, bang, message. Like, bro, you did amazing. Watch from this point. This is how I found you. By the way, I'm doing this is what I'm doing. Um, would love to pick your brains. I told him my backstory. I would love to pick your brains. Um, just get some advice because basically I have no fucking clue what I'm doing. Um, and so he agrees. We have we did we we had a call. And I was like buzzing after the call. And at the time I was still going to LA quite a lot and he lives in Denver. So I was there for July, for 4th of July. And I, before I went, I messaged him. I was like, hey, Robbie, uh, I don't suppose you'd be keen to get like a training run in if I fly into Denver. And he was like, yeah, for sure, definitely. So I flew to LA as normal, went to my apartment, went to sleep for like three hours, 
woke up, went back to LAX, was on the 6 a.m. flight to Denver. He picks me up from Denver Airport. We drive to Boulder, which is already at elevation, by the way. Fire. I don't know what elevation it was, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm basically. basically sea level and we're at like two, i don't know what it is two thousand meters whatever but the air is thin i'm dehydrated i'm jet lagged i've hardly slept and we're going on a 10 mile trail run up a hill <laughs> up a hill in boulder so he drags me around and obviously he's still kind of hurting so wasn't in tip-top condition from what he'd done but I was basically passing out towards the end. We got down. I didn't have any water with me, so I was an idiot for that, that fact as well. He had these two tiny little handhelds. So we finish. We go, so we go get, get some food, have a beer, and then we're at, we're at his place afterwards. And he shows me his spreadsheet of his planning. Pages. Really? Fuel. Strava links to each day, what shoes he'd be wearing, how many miles he'd done, what state he's in, what gas cost, what, how many calories he needed. And I was like, wow. hold up, I've done absolutely none of this. He did, I didn't tell him this at this point, but when he was there, he sat me down when we were going over, I was like, yeah, this is so helpful, thanks for this. And he's like, what? I'm gonna come help you do yours. <laughs> I was like, wow. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm going to come help. He was like, I have to ask my fiance, Sh Shelly, because I have just ran for 75 miles and she, she had to work and wasn't there that whole time. So he had to ask her, but he did end up coming. So I've like, like said, sorry to interrupt, man. It's unbelievable. Like, don't get me wrong, I, I feel concerned about some aspects of social media, but it's more mm -hmm. so human beings kind of habitual and addictive tendencies but obviously you see the documentary like um what's it called the social uh, oh yeah social network social network whatever other the one on netflix about mm -hmm. the algorithms that they play on our kind of habitual tendencies and even when i'm trying to work and stuff i find my thumb going from email habitually to like instagram fatal you know but yeah. anyway that is such a cool sign of technology how it can connect great people that never would have had the opportunity to connect before yeah um, you go from being inspired by this dude's unbelievable run ask him a question it's cool enough to bloody travel meet the dude to do a training run mm -hmm. but then the man is willing to come from america to the yeah. uk to support you on a run it's incredible. Um, it's it's amazing man like it's just these kind of things uh, i find amazing i mean i i connected with a guy on my instagram a couple a week or so a couple weeks back from a he heard me on a podcast i did in new zealand he hit me up to talk about pure sport products he said him and his old man were having a tough time um they're having some bad aches and pains and he was really interested in hearing about the cbd products told him all about the products he asked me about which ones are best how to use it blah 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 and then the last thing he was like oh we're we're in new zealand from i asked him we're in new zealand he said he's from wellington i go oh my grandparents live in wellington just like you know normal conversation yeah he goes, Bro, i'm going out fishing with my old man uh i'm gonna drop some sea some seafood off to your grandparents i said no nah, don't worry bro you don't have to do that he's like nah this is what i love to do anyway drops it off to my grandparents bro that is the like, <laughs> yeah. day of my grandparents' life. I've not been able to see them for a couple of years because I'm over here. Mm. But just this lovely local dude going there for no other purpose but to be a good dude, drop these things. Like my grandparents, it was the day of their life. Like they were so happy. I'm in the good books because he, <laughs> he told my grandparents he was doing it on behalf of me when really mm -hmm. just a legend. Um, but, you know, it's it's so cool like the power of connecting with people uh to me that story with, with robbie it's 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 amazing man like and he's a friend of yours you know now to this day isn't he mm -hmm. yeah he f so the, the whole thing was filmed and um he flew over for the little evening we put on show, showing that juggle film um we have plans to do challenges together he's hoping hoping to come over if covid 
COVID finishes and he's got a three peaks challenge to do. So I've signed, signed up straight away. It's like I am forever indebted to that guy more than, more than just for him kept giving me his time for that. He just gave me his whole self and is a guy that I will constantly look up to and seek advice from. So yeah, I owe that guy a lot. And yeah, the, the power of social media sometimes f for connecting in the ways we've just said is, is insane and wouldn't be able to happen if it wasn't there. So mm. yeah, sometimes it's an incredibly valuable tool. And like you said, sometimes you end up and it's been 45 minutes and you're scrolling through some discovery feed and you're like, my, my brain is actually melting yeah. Yeah. seeing this stuff because it's such a waste of time and I'm not present with my friends. I'm at a dinner, the phone's there. That's why I love that whole thing of like the phones in the middle thing where you go out for dinner. And I think, I think we, everyone should adopt that way more and watching the social network and things like that it, it gives you it gives you a kick up the ass to be present and especially like with you with your grandparents you really have to think about it that we we all have a certain amount of time on this planet and there are special people that we love and some of the time we are wasting our time when we're with them and especially wasting their time because we're sometimes you should just you need to put it down mm. have those conversations and actually because they have like your grandparents and stuff have a wealth of knowledge and when well this is anyone friends whatever no one's life is certain it's not going to go on forever so you can learn a lot from them the things you're going to miss when they're gone is a lot of the questions you didn't ask or those kind of, that you can learn a lot from people so yeah that's something i've definitely learned wow it's, it's definitely very very um it's something really worthwhile to like reflect on for ourselves eh? and i think one thing i've learned is like there was times in my life um and I'm, I'm by far still a work in progress but like i've come a long way but you know where where things like alcohol and and these things were a real issue for me and with my lack of understanding i would blame the actual like drink or or you know like the casino or you know whatever and actually it's about questioning yourself and what is going on within you that's creating these things to be like an attachment or or an addiction um because if you look around the world like there are people that can have one beer or two beers and have a nice time and socialize or even go out and have a big night out but that's you know every now and then and mm -hmm. uh, or they can go and gamble and do it for fun and you know once a year or something like that or um they pe many people utilize social media for good and it's not uh, addictive um so i think we can often easily blame the thing and say oh i need to just cut this out all and that may be part of the journey to say cut things out for a while but i think when we blame the the tool or the object or the thing it's not addressing the issue the underlying it's like what is it within me what am i what feelings am i trying to escape or what am i yeah what am i trying to dull down or what am i not facing within me that i'm utilizing probably subconsciously you know these things to 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 kind of as a coping mechanism or, or a tool to kind of not address what i need to so that was that's that's a big thing for me and like you said man it's um yeah like we we can do so much better with being present and i for one man one of the things with my business is i find it very very challenging it's a new experience i mean obviously the business has been going for over two years now but you know these two years has been an experience where I need to learn how to switch off from something. Um, so it's about, it's not blaming the business though. It's like, what is it within me that keeps my mind attached here? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's cool to kind of hear your experiences and hear you reflect on on that. And um, it's something insightful for people, I think, that they can take away from this and start to question as well. Um, but, but bro, just a quick one. I, I, I obviously the the challenge that Jono got to Land's End that you did was unbelievable. I'm grateful that you did it because 
our good buddy, Dean Adamson, who's one of your... Yeah, Dean, boy, he's back today, by the way. Oh, mate, we're going to have to... I think we're seeing him on Saturday. We'll get to yeah. that about what's happening on Saturday. But um, I, I'm thankful you did it. Uh, it inspired me. It made me see, see things. But, like, one of the coolest bits was our buddy, Dean, who's who has, was my teammate at the time, guy I love, get along with really well. He he came to me, he's like, bro, my good buddy, Will, he's running this marathon, uh, ultra marathon. He's like four days in, his body is battered. Um, uh, Dean had been on the Pure Sport CBD for some of his injuries. He's like, bro, can we, I'm driving down to help run with him and support him. Can we? Can I grab some CBD to take him? Because he, I think he's gonna need it, bro. Um, tell me a bit about that experience, and and it's a moment I'm always thankful for. So shout out to Dean for that. Yeah, big up Dean, the connector. Um, yeah, um, it was it was it was a strange it was a strange experience for me. And as I alluded to earlier, I'd always been interested in recovery. So like I was doing the cryotherapy, I'd had CBD before, but it was like at a gym where you put it in the shake and I was like, well, I don't know. And I didn't know if the CBD was good or whatever. Listened to a lot of podcasts, was always super interested in it. I'd never actually, I'd never actually bought it myself other than the, the $4 extra or something it cost to Equinox Gym. <laughs> um, so when Johnny Goat Slams End started, I was, I was, I would say I was very naive by the way. Um, but as a kid growing up, like, we would get from mum from mum if if we we're in pain or if we were sick or whatever you might get some paracetamol and ibuprofen but unless you really really need something that's as far as it's going she was a nurse she was smart i was young dumb and pointing the finger against the man like why <laughs> like like if i'm in pain just give me something that's actually going to fix it anyway pretty pretty poor story this is but obviously my mum had drugs for when she was going through cancer and we had some codeine, it had a name on, Miss Amanda Gooch. It's in the medical box. I'm going to run 875 miles. I'm going to be in some pain. See the codeine, I'm like, come in with me, medical bag, done. Um, this is where the naivety starts. Read. We seem to have lost Will there. Um, let's see if he comes back shortly. Um, I'll help with his... Oh, I'll I'm back. Sorry, bro. Oh, I, I think I connection. I got yeah. to this cause drowsiness, right? Is that about that? Okay, yeah, sorry. pretty much you were at where you chucked the um, coding into the, into the uh, medical uh, bag. Read it read the package may cause drowsiness take up to eight pills a day i'm like i'm gonna be tired anyway because i'm out here 16 18 hours a day drowsiness is fine i've got that already so let's pop them i'm going through the day so i stop every six miles by the way every six miles i have a can of coke or red bull codeine pill or every or every other one so codeine pill red bull sweet carry on First day is obviously fine. Second day seems okay. I know I'll run as high as I spoke about earlier. It's a feeling of like you can carry on going for everywhere. You might get like a rush sensation in your legs. You feel great. This is something that I, I still get today. I got it yesterday when I was running. I redefined run as high as seeing shit that wasn't there. And I don't know if you've had them or know what they are, but night terrors. So a lot of hallucinations not being with it i kind of lost who i am quite a nice guy even in the worst of times and i was turning into the shittiest bloke to my team my team members that were there off their own back no one was getting paid people were literally there giving me their time paying out of pocket for their expenses whatever i'm being i'm being a bit of a wanker i ain't gonna lie um and i'm doing this for nine days and it's getting progressively worse so i started 63 miles and it goes like 55, 50, and then falls off a cliff the fourth day, I do 30 miles. Roll my ankle. I have 
insane inflammation from the hips down both knees both ankles everything's getting wrapped up um i'm still popping pills like it's fun no none of these evenings i slept properly at all um i can't convey what was happening in there but robbie would come in in the morning with my like oatmeal and for the like the next hour i would either think i did a good job in the middle of the night like a good job throughout the night when I wasn't sleeping and tossing and turning or a bad one, which makes absolutely no sense because I wasn't moving <clears throat> other than rolling around in pain. Doing this for nine days, someone's job, well, someone gets, to someone gets told like they're concerned about me because obviously I'm doing stories and people are seeing how I'm acting and whatnot. And people are concerned, the, the team are getting messages like something's really not right with Will right now. Like, is there, what, what's he doing? What's he taking? And obviously they know because I'm asking for the codeine, like before bed, codeine, when I wake up, codeine. Um, so they're saying, they're like, that is <laughs> the dumbest idea ever. And a lot of people listening to this will be thinking, you're an idiot. And you're completely right. I was an idiot. Um, so it's my, bro my brother gets the job because he can, he, can, he can take on a fuck you from me because he's my brother. So he's like, it's day nine, halfway through the day. I've just woke up from a nap. The, the um, ones closest to us can take the oi fuck off and make him you can get it back yeah. from him and it's yeah exactly. Yeah. exactly so he was gonna take it i woke up from a nap i've been dribbling i was still spaced out cloudy well it comes along well you can't take coding anymore literally this is what i said all right mum because that's what i normally say when my mum was loud when i wasn't allowed proper drugs or whatever all right mum like relax like it's fine no he's like no nah, seriously you're not taking it anymore have an ibuprofen or have a lucasade and keep going and at this point the team had been talking for a few days about reevaluating my time schedule and when i was going to finish because initially i said two weeks which would have been mental um going like that was a that was a high bar to raise not really training or being ready for it how many miles a day or kilometers a day would two weeks have been targeted for the, uh, for the whole? I think it was six. I think it was 60. That's yeah. crazy. 60 yeah. miles a day for two weeks for a dude yeah. who had never run back to back. Like you'd done, you'd run ultra marathons, but never back to that. So, yeah, nothing like a bit of a, nothing like a bit of a good heart. Yeah. Hey, I'll do that. <laughs> I'll wing it. Just like those tests in school. Yeah. Yeah. After that conversation with Robbie, I have the CBD at this point, by the way. As you said, Dean, Dean brought it out to me on day four, but I hadn't taken it because I almost didn't want to ruin my flow of what I was doing. I was Day four was my worst day, by the way. So taking you something know, out. You don't know, do you? When you're in the moment, it's like you stick with what you know until otherwise happens. I'm... I'm my, so i haven't taken it um robbie comes out after i told my brother to fuck off about the coding and he was like we've been speaking for a few days between us like we think you're going to be finishing next wednesday which was like 18 days and i was like first off the initial thought i had was you you motherfucker you speaking behind my back about how long am we going to take and you haven't and it's taken you three three days to man up and fucking tell me this like i was pissed and then, and then I was, then I instantly and very quickly became disappointed in myself that this was actually a reality of what it could be. Like they're not, they're saying 18 days that Robbie's like, the information's mad. You've, you've started off well, you're, you're going downhill. Like you're, you're around 40 miles. Some like you did that 30, the information is crazy. He's like, this is, this is our plan now. He was like, you can either go today and get to 50 miles and then we give you an entire day off and you do, I think it was like 45 miles a day uh, to, to finish on that Wednesday. I'm pissed off still at this point, thinking like, stop fucking talking to me about what the maths is because I don't care. Um, and then then I'm in a mood where I'm like, I'm gonna, pro I'm gonna prove them wrong. <laughs> And what I didn't know at this point was my brother said when Robbie got back in the car, because they, they were crewing one of them together, he was he said to Robbie, he was like, he's he's gonna finish before Wednesday. He was like, I think he'll finish on. 
I think he's going to finish on Monday. From that point on, I'd obviously stop taking codeine. This is halfway through day nine. I think I got to 55 miles that day, which was obviously more than I'd done most of the days before. And then that night, I was like, oh, I can't take codeine, can I? So I was like, ah, that I, I got that CBD from Dean's Kiwi, mate, Grayson. I was like, mm -hmm. that's that's natural. No one can tell me I can't take that. So now I go bash under the tongue, go to sleep. Next day, um, one of my brother's friends, Alistair Cook, uh, highest test scorer in cricket, big deal. He surprises me by waking me up. Um, he's coming to run with me that day. I didn't know it was happening. He wakes me up, opens the door. I'm like, oh, oh. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing here? And then, the t then I think it was Joshua Robbie coming there, like, bro, you're right. You look, you look really tired. Is you, you okay? And then instantly, I was like, it's like you just woke me up from deep sleep. I haven't had that for the previous nine nights. Like I didn't have that, and all of, I was. I was buzzing and you can see on the on the movie they put together they're they're spoken to afterwards by the camera guy then and robbie goes it's amazing man like all the inflammation out his knees and ankles sorry about this accent if you ever listen to this robbie Oh, we have lost Will again. He'll be back, I hope. Um, but yeah, pretty, uh, pretty unbelievable. Um, how, firstly, like it's amazing to kind of see the insight into Will's experience with coding. How I, I feel it can actually, although it, things like that may be helpful in short term, if over prolonged use, may actually get in the way of the body's natural ability to recover and function. Um, and I had these experiences with my knee injury um, in the peak of my rugby career. Uh, I, I was in a lot of pain and trying to train and play to the same capacity. And I was very, very reliant on heavy painkillers um, like codeine. So it's uh, wheels back. Um, so no, it's, it's fascinating to see, and I'm sure there's many others that have had a similar experience with these opioid and, you know, bloody, you know, I won't sugarcoat it, very toxic painkillers. Um, although they can have short term effects that may be helpful. They're not designed to be in our bodies over a long time. They kind of block us from our natural capacity to um, adapt to the situation. And, uh, it's quite amazing, Will, that that was your. You know, I mean, it's not. I'm not surprised, but mm. it's, it's a, a really great insight into how these things may seem like a good idea. Yeah, like it's like, oh, these block the pain. These will help me get through this run, and they may have had that effect for a short term, but actually, it became a negative effect. You weren't sleeping right. Your moods were altered. Your clarity of mind was altered your body's ability to adapt was altered. So what I love the most about that story is um, that you, it's something that's relatable to so many people. Like we're taught or we live in a culture that wants the quick fix. It's mm -hmm. like painkiller, master pain. I, I had a rogue player, you had it on your uh, ultra marathon. But I know in my experience, it's not sustainable, it's not good, and it doesn't have the desired effects, and it actually has adverse effects long-term. Um, and it's pretty amazing that, you know, you saw that firsthand in a, in a pretty swift turnaround. With yeah, your a very quick period of time, and what I missed was the juicy part after that was, from that point on, I ran 60 miles plus every day until the end on day 16 which i i did 45 because that's all that was left um and i had my biggest day i think it was two days after that where i did 72. so i woke up in the middle of the night and did another 12 at 2 a.m so i had a, a an insanely profound experience using pure sport cbd and 
I'm not in that environment anymore. So I'm not saying that happens because I'm not I'm I'm not in that scenario. But I still get I still get all those positive effects just in smaller ways, whether I'm doing a challenge like I'm doing now, or just in day to day normal life. So yeah. I was, no. I, was, I was deep in it as soon as soon as I took it, and yeah, yeah. it's been a very sort of organic way of growing um our our friendship as just like a standpoint then and then into what we're doing now where you guys are supporting me and hopefully i'm helping you in some way as well no man it's um it ties in perfectly with pure sport what we're all about you know something that happened off the cuff and naturally uh you know i i didn't anticipate any form of promotion or coverage i was dean just said hey bro my mate's having a tough time i i reckon the cbd can help him and that's the kind of guy you are <laughs> <laughs> and man i mean obviously i was inspired by the journey and i was like man i want to help out um no matter what so it's uh, it's cool like it, it kind of fits perfectly in line with like we as pure sport are, uh, pure sport are a community you know we're about Yes, the amazing benefits of CBD of our of our CBD, um, and but it's about a deeper picture as well of understanding our own health and well being, and how CBD yes can play a part in this, but it can play a bigger part as well in terms of educating ourselves on a lifestyle um, and educating ourselves to see through some of the cultural. Um, I think sticking points that we have around quick fixes uh, and that's what inspires me hugely about the CBD movement and pure sport as a community is we're about a group of people who love the products who are about understanding a bigger picture um, health and lifestyle movement and man you've played a huge part in that um, you know the challenges that you do the the guy that you are um, you, you generate a lot of interest people are interested in you and uh, I, I I think it's so cool that pure sport since that day has become just a given part of your lifestyle. And it's not, a, it's not like you're promoting or trying to sell shit. It's like, you're just talking about what you use mm -hmm. and what you benefit from on a daily basis. So that's the same we have for anyone who represents us, who's part of our team community. So now nah, it's, um, it's cool. And I'm glad we could, we were able to share that with people. And then that takes us into the, um, this current challenge, the 12 marathons of Christmas. Mm -hmm. so, so Will's gone on to take on board some crazy challenges. Not long ago, he did, he ran for 24 hours straight, which was insane. Um, would have faced some some mental and physical demons there. Uh, I joined you for, I think, 12 kilometers, um, which to me at the time was a big, big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, so much respect for that. Um, now the 12 marathons I want to touch on because this is something that, you know, you're, you're on day, this is day three now. Yeah. Um, so Will is running a marathon a day for 12 days. And the man is living his life. Like, it's not like he's sitting there resting, recovering. Of course, he's doing the things that he has to do. He's he's doing his recovery protocol. But the man worked yesterday. The man was on, on set for a whole day, caught the train to Manchester, caught the train home ran a marathon and completed it at 1.30 a.m. So this dude's taking on 12 marathons all the while doing all the other aspects of his life that he has to do. So if that ain't inspiring, man, like, I don't know what is. <laughs> uh, and all the while, um, Will is um, putting out his um, fundraising for Macmillan Cancer uh, Research, which is an unbelievable cause. And obviously, as you know, something that's dear to his heart through the the passing of his um, beloved mum Mandy something close to my heart with my old man um passing away from cancer um pure sport is is like unbelievably proud to to have Will representing us proud of this challenge proud of all the cool shit Will does um and what we're doing is we are supporting Will through the run um through this campaign uh so what we're saying is we want anyone out there to run as many kilometers as you please you can run one kilometer you can run i don't know if you're a madman you can run 100 if you want i'm not i'm not suggesting you do that and what you do is you run your kilometers you donate to the link in the pure sport bio 
um, that you donate a pound per kilometer that you run, you tag Pure Sport and Will Googe, let us know how much you ran and donated. Pure Sport will match your donation uh, because we just want to get this out there as much as possible. We think it's an amazing thing, an amazing cause. Not only great for the charity, but it's inspiring for people to test their limits, go out, get be part of something bigger, part of our community. So get involved, people. Um, the other thing is this Saturday um, at Hyde Park, Everything's going to be social distance. Um, we're going to set off in small groups. Um, 11 a.m. we're meeting. There will be a spot that we will put out on our social media to meet. Uh, and we're going to run. That's going to be Will's sixth marathon of this campaign. Uh, I'm attempting to run a full marathon. Um, if you know me, you know I've got absolutely buggered knees. So I'm going to do my best. If Will can get through 875 miles, uh, I'm going to try get through 40, uh, 875 miles. I'm going to try get through 42 kilometers. I'm not going to take coding. I'm going to be CBD only. I'm going to be lathering up my joint with the balm. I'm going to be having a tincture in my pocket on the way. Um, but my inspiration will be the fact that Will's doing 12 of these. He's on his sixth, so I'm going to try get through one. But we welcome anyone to come along. You can run as little or as much as you want. You can run one kilometer. You can run the whole marathon with us yeah. i know we will be hugely grateful for your support i will be it'll be a cool day to get people together obviously not too close with all the guidelines um and yeah i mean I, i'm excited i'm hugely excited for it um huge respect to will will we're gonna wrap yeah. up but i got a few quick fire questions that i want and i want you to try answer them within a sentence or two all right How's that one? yeah let's go wrap it off okay. All right. What's the best book that you've read? Uh, one I really like is Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's like a, it's a history book from when humankind began up until now. Very interesting. Good. Check that out. Um, this is going to be a tough one to answer in a short one. If you can summarize in a sentence or two, what's the biggest life lesson you've learned to date? Embrace the suck. Say that again, embrace. Control the controllable. Control embrace the, controllable. the suck, control the controllable. Mm. So shit That's, things are going to happen. Freedom and control. Yeah. Mm. If shit does That's happen, it's like right? control. Like, yeah. Shit ain't going to go to plan, but we got to face it, get through it. No, I love that. Um, <laughs> another thing, okay, maybe a tough one to summarize, but I, I, I'd say you're an inspiration for quite a lot of young dudes that look up to you. Um, what is what is the biggest lesson you've learned from relationships with girls? Relationships with girls. I think if they're not going to accept you for who you are, then stop stop wasting your time. You shouldn't have to you shouldn't have to change for anybody. You should always be your true self. And if that isn't it, then don't don't try and change who you are to please someone else. Bloody good advice. And it goes vice versa, doesn't it? Yeah, don't exactly. Same way. You shouldn't and you shouldn't if if you're if you're with someone, you shouldn't want to change them. You should you should love them for who they are, their flaws and all. So yeah, pretty good. Where would you like to be, and what would you like to be doing in ten years' time? Ten years' time, <laughs> I don't know. I would have wanted to. So I'm all about building my life resume. Um, so when it's all said and done, I want to have a list of things I've done that aren't particularly normal, and I've learned lessons from. So. 10 years from now, I'm going to be 26. I'm still going to be wanting to do some mad running challenges. Um, where that is, I don't know. I have goals to run across America like Robbie did. I feel that's a rite of passage for me. Um, yeah, still running, still doing challenges. So not changing too much, but yeah, more secure, I'd say. I don't know if I misheard you, but I think you said in 10 years you're going to be 26. That would yeah. be sense. Just to let the people know out there, we'll, we'll I'm not <laughs> who was addicted to coding for his run. <laughs> All good. Nah, mate, honestly, bloody pleasure to have you on. Pleasure to have you a part of Pure Sport. Um, love all that you're doing. Proud to call you a mate. And uh, I'll see you probably in about half an hour because you got your third marathon. I'm running 10 kilometers with you as a warm-up for my attempted marathon on Saturday. So... Thank you so much, bro, and I uh, hope the people enjoyed that.
I, I sure did. And see you soon. I want to give a big shout out to you personally as well, Grayson, and everyone at Pure Sport, because the level of commitment you show, show me and a lot of your other ambassadors, you go as a business and as a, as a person, you always seem to go over and above what is what is normal. And that's why you'll be successful in what you do. And that's why I consider you a very close friend of mine. So just know that it means a huge deal to me. And if anyone's listening to this, the CBD products work, I think you should try them. And even if, you, even if you're thinking that you don't want to, or you have questions about it, reach out to someone, they'll answer your questions. And if you're going to support someone, support this guy in this brand, because yeah, this, this is not regular stuff. This is not, he's not a normal human being and what he does. He could be straight business and just look at profit margins, but he's not, he's looking at people. So yeah, big love to you. G. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. And I mean, yeah, you, you uh, we, we're about the, we want people to be part of it, you know? So you know, that use our products, you're part of our team. Um, mm. Will's part of our team. You know, we we look at our customers as you're one of us. So we want you to get the best out of your experience with our products, but just life. You know, that's why we set this brand up. So now I really appreciate the kind words, man. And uh I'll see you very soon. Little 10 clicks. Come on. <laughs> Big love. Hey. Oh.